Hello and welcome. Uh, we are looking at the international ramification of the signing of the EPA. Uh, now, Joy News has it on very good authority that barring any unforeseen circumstances, Ghana would be joining the economic community of West Africa states, ECOWAS, to sign the Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, with the European Union. Now, a little bit close to government has uh, let us in on a little secret that this has been influenced by the threat to Ghana's export to the EU if it does not sign the trade agreement. In the first place, there are differing opinions on whether or not we can live up to the terms of the agreement and still develop as a competitive pay space as a nation. Uh, then we look at the na our neighbors in ECOWAS who won't sign the agreement, like Nigeria and wonder what future relation on the economic front would be like. Now some people even think signing this document will tip the balance in favor of our more developed donor countries. It seems a bit too late to continue the process. So what is the way forward? In the studio with me to deliberate these matters is Edward Kariwa, Deputy General Secretary of General Agricultural Workers Union and uh, we are going to be looking at the international ramifications too. So joining us later will be Dr. Vladimir Entridanso, who will bring the international aspect to it. My name is Nana Ansakwao, and this is PM Express. Signing the EPA or not, what will be the uh, international ramifications? And uh, EPA is on the table again. Why? Because it is such an important subject. It is one that really uh, doesn't even look at us as a generation, but posterity. What are we leaving behind for them? And that's how important it is. Uh, with me again is my own brother, Edward. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm glad in the talk EPA. You make time for us. I mean, it's, you know, Thank you. it's good. Yeah. Edward, from, from, from all indications, you know, Ghana is going to sign the agreement. Uh, TUC is saying sign, but not in its current form. Uh, what's in the current form, you know, that TUC doesn't want? And what would we add for you to be happy to sign? Well, thanks very much. And then... Um I would also say good evening to your viewers and many Ghanaians who have been following uh, these programs and making contributions to ensure that Ghana becomes a better place, not only for we those who are alive, but generations to come. Well, let me put it that we have always not been against trade relations with the European Union, and uh, it uh, predates our independence. And then um, after independence, later in the years, we had uh, the Lomi Conventions and then finally we moved to the Cotonou Agreement. So we do acknowledge that the EU is an important trading partner with the rest of West Africa and Ghana in particular. But what we are looking at now is this, is the EPA. And the EPA was basically or is basically a free trade agreement. And um, it, is been, it has been designed in order to comply with WTO uh, regulations or conditions. But unfortunately, what we have on table is more than what the WTO is requiring. And um, it also is a point where what we have disagreed and kicked against a WTO, that is Ghana, West Africa, and all developing countries, those clauses have now been brought into the EPA at this bilateral arrangement. That is what we are saying. Please, we acknowledge that we have to continue to have a trade relations with the EU, but then we should not sign into a, a, a trade agreement that is WTO plus. In other words, 
that is more than what is provided for in the WTO. This is our point. Hmm. EPA, I mean, coming to look at it, apart from it, the sentimental uh, who are about it, it's, it's good for us. Well, as it stands, since uh, 2007, when Ghana initialed the interim EPA, we continue to enjoy uh, preferential treatment. And we had to move from preferential treatment, trade arrangement with the EU, to a reciprocal uh, trade arrangement, which is under the EPA. It means that Ghana's exports to the EU remained uh, duty-free, quota-free mm -hmm. arrangement. That is to say that our exports will not attract duty when they are entering the EU market. So to that extent, that is an advantage mm -hmm. because it makes us a little more uh, competitive in the uh, EU market because there are no tariffs on it and we can sell cheaper, a little cheaper than other countries that attract uh, uh, goods that attract uh, tariffs. So to that extent, it is good. But we cannot continue to think that exporting to the EU market without duty is the panacea to our economic development or is going to add much more value to it. What we need to do is that we should prepare ourselves to be able to meet the global competition by ensuring that our exports are of international standard, our exports are quality, our exports are uh, competitive in, in, uh, in terms of uh, price. And if we need to do that, which is a more sustainable arrangement, not only to the EU market, but globally. That there are other markets, like the China market is there, the, the, the Latin American market is there, the Indian market is there, and so on. We need to either concentrate on the quality of our goods to make sure that cost of production becomes low, and which will translate into the selling price of our uh, uh, produce or products in the international market. So the solution lies with that. But it's not just about having to sell cocoa beans to the EU market for all these years and for years to come just because it is going to be duty-free, quota-free. Now, I, I, I may sound cynical here, but it is one thing which maybe is a case, maybe is a deficiency, but I, I, I don't think we can ever do it. We have never shown the commitment, the willpower, government after government have talked about value addition, value addition. Indeed, e, uh, EPA came into being or you know, it was mentioned in 2000. After seven years, they came back and brought the interim. We are now in 2014, so 14 years. And none of our government ever thought that, listen, well, you know, this thing is going to change and it's going to be a real thing. So let us even start making chocolates, biscuits. Let us start growing rubber and make pl nothing. So we sit there and 2014 suddenly say, oh, no, we want to sign a contract which will still favor us. I mean, we, 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 uh, we can have our cake and eat it, Edward. Yeah, there is a certain arrangement which may spare you on. There's also another one which indeed will kill your, your spirit. The trade arrangement that we have with the EU over the years indeed has not helped us to become more responsible, become more forceful, and just because we can continue to export, for instance, uh, raw cocoa beans to the EU. But if there had been in the past a blockade on raw cocoa beans by way of higher tariffs, on our cocoa beans to the EU market, by now we'll have thought twice and then we'll produce the beans and we'll process it into something more acceptable and more uh, uh, value added form, which we can then send to the EU market. And in that case, it then even becomes uh, we can consume it. How many of us can consume the uh, cocoa beans? You can chew it, it's not like granules, but even if it's like granules, how much of granules can you chew? You know? so, the, 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 the trade arrangement over the period 
has also helped to put us where we are. And that's why it takes a more, uh, 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 someone who has got a very strong vision to say that, look, even though this is, the, is good for the short term, let me look ahead. And that is why, you, you, if you look at Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, he, he believed in what? The, the, the impulse substitution uh, uh, industrialization process, which means that whatever we consume in this country, we should try as much as possible to produce it. Even though it is impossible to produce all the things that you need and you consume, but you end up producing the basics, the things that you have comparative advantage, and eventually you could also have competitive advantage. But the unfortunate thing about us is that we have abandoned the import substitution development strategy and now moved to have the export uh, uh, strategy, oriented strategy, which means that whatever we produce in this country, we are targeting the international market. And that is where our exports become fragile because once you target the international market and whenever there's a problem with the international market, you don't have domestic market for it. But if we begin to produce for internal consumption, the excess can then be exported. And in that case, when we face problems with the international market, we even can still break even because we already have developed a market here for the producers. So even though they will lose some revenue, they, they can still meet the optimum level of production. You see, apart from Nkrumah, and I think even the president admitted it, I mean, if there's any such word, we are running a, a Gorgisbarian economy. And economy set up by God in Gorgisberg was that, let me come and take as much natural resources and give it to the queen. And God in Gorgisberg goes, we take over our country, and then we decide, well, since God in Gorgisberg was taking one ton, let us try and take five tons so we can make more money. So we are actually perfecting a system which doesn't work. And therefore, you know, any time you talk resources, gold, diamond, the first thing anybody thinks is, who is the nearest white man who wants it? To the fact that we're even going to Etiwa Forest, you know, the people who want to go to Etiwa Forest to, to go and mine. I mean, that's how, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what word to use, but that's how we have bound. So for us, maybe EPA will be best because I don't think there's any government who is willing to set up a factory to even produce just add value to just one thing, bauxite or diamond or gold or timber, just one thing. Nobody wants to do it. Well, that is why we are much more concerned about the EPS at its current form, because it perpetuates the status quo. That is, always producing for the external market, mm -hmm. and then continue to produce raw materials for the external market. Because the, the arrangement within the EPA is that Look, you produce, we are not going to have tariffs on it, on your exports, because we need those uh, as raw materials. So you continue to produce the raw materials for us, and we in turn produce and return the manufactured goods to you, so that you too, you can say, look, we are not going to place import tariffs on your uh, manufactured goods into our, your country. So we are now arranging that, give us the raw materials. It's more like a better type of relationship now. Give us the raw materials, we'll give you the manufactured goods. Don't tax our manufactured goods when they are coming in. We too will not tax your uh, uh, raw material uh, goods when they are coming into our country. And this is what is, is being perpetuated under the EPAs. So for how long can we continue to depend on the fact that we are not being taxed? In the EU market, and that is the way out. If it had been, then we would have actually come out of it. But we are saying that let us sacrifice today, let us shift away from this uh, uh, reciprocal uh, trade arrangement where we move from quota free to uh, and uh, duty free to accepting to pay a little more on our exports to the EU market, and that case. We do also reserve the right to tax the EU imports that are coming into our country, which will enable us to generate revenue. And we determine how much tax we can put on that, even though we know that we cannot do that capriciously. We cannot do that without taking cognizance of 
uh, other tar uh, tariffs levels uh, globally within the sub-region and so on. But the important thing is that we reserve the right to select goods and, tariff and, and tax them. We can reduce tariffs on a particular good. We can also increase tariffs on a particular good that is coming into the country. Is there nobody in Africa that needs these goods that we're taking uh, you know, to, to Europe? I mean, cocoa beans, is there no one in Africa that makes chocolate that you know, would buy cocoa beans? Uh, whatever it is that we are taking there in the raw states. I mean, can we not trade amongst ourselves? Why, why Europe? And if we are going to go to Europe, then... You know, if we don't trade, if we won't trade with Africa, why are we complaining? Well, that is also one of the, uh, what we are calling on our leaders to do, that look, don't just think that the EU market is the only market for us. The group, the world is changing, and there are new markets that are emerging. The emerging countries, China is there. Mm -hmm. If we are able, for instance, to get Chinese to begin to like our cocoa, 5% of Chinese, the Chinese population, to like our cocoa, we don't even need the EU market. And that is what we should be looking at, new markets. If we can export cocoa to India, if we can export cocoa to Brazil, we, we, we would reduce the demand or the pressure on us to export to only EU. Now, what EU is seeing is this. They need to continue to lock us in for raw materials. So let's have this treaty which will restrict you from selling to any other market apart from the EU market. Why are they, how are they doing that? The way they are doing it is this, that there's what we call the, uh, the most favored nation clause, which says that once you sign this EPA with the EU, you cannot have a, a more favorable trade relations with another at another party than the EU. If you do so, then the EU it it automatically you know uh, uh, stand to benefit from it. So, for instance, if we have favorable terms of trade with China, because we think that we need construction, much of our roads are bad, and we need and we said, look, we can sell our cocoa to you less than that in return for technology and then construction uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. then the EU, with the EPS, if we sign them today, it says, no, you cannot do that for China. Once those terms are more favorable than the terms of trade that you have with us, we automatically benefit from it. But is that not the, I'll, I'll take a break here and I'll come back, but that's the WTO reciprocal deal. So let's, let's find out that. Why shouldn't it work like that? If I look after you this way, why are you going to look after somebody? Because at the moment, the whole idea of EPA is that you are being favored over other countries, and that's why we are trying to equalize. So once we've equalized, why are you looking elsewhere? Stay tuned. We're coming back. Well, we are looking at preferential. I mean, the, the background of EPA is that, uh, you know, African and uh, Caribbean countries are able to take their goods into the EU market quota-free, duty-free. And then the other partners or the other countries in the world, obviously, world Road to the World Trade Organization, say that this is not fair because let's say if I brought cocoa from you know, Brazil and then you brought cocoa from Ghana, the Brazil cocoa would then incur taxes and the Ghana one will not. So Brazil then will complain and say, look, it's not fair. You need to make the, even, uh, the playing field even. And the EU market then comes back to African countries who are uh, getting this privilege to say that, no, we can't give you the privilege again because otherwise Brazil is going to take me to court and he's going to find me for not playing fair. So now, uh, either you let me bring my goods to your country free and you bring mine so that it becomes an arrangement that we have, or... Let's just scrap it. I tax you and you tax me. And this is where we are. But this thing came on the drawing board in 2000. And then it was supposed to be signed in 2007. And 2007, we raised our red flags and said, oh, no, no, no. We're not ready. Uh, give us more time. It's now 2014. And then we brought our flags back to the table again. Edward to say, no, we still don't have more time. And therefore, give us more time. But then, you see, 
like I said, it becomes an even kill. You know, you can't, we, we, we can't tell them that do this, do that, do this, do this. When they don't do it for other countries, they, they get reported to uh, W, you know, TO. Well, we are all members of the uh, WTO. We are bound to comply with the WTO rules. And for that matter, we are not encouraging the EU to violate WTO rules. But we are not also saying that they should give us some more favorable terms than any other country they do. That is precisely what we are saying. That look, let us reserve the right to also place tariffs on imports that are coming into our country. And you don't need to be an economist or mathematician to know how much we are going to lose and what will be the consequences on our economy, particularly local producers. If we allow 75% of goods coming from EU into our country duty-free, quota-free. Okay, well, see, if, if I look at it, right, I look at things like generators, uh, cars, plants, mills, steel mills, steel machines, oil rigs, and uh, I mean, we don't make these things. So if these things are going to come in duty-free, quota-free, it works well for you and I, where probably these cameras will come in free, so production will be cheaper. So they, if you look at it, it will work well for us. Unless, of course, Kwame Nkrumah resurrected and decided that, no, I'm going to add value. But from judging from past records, you know, none of our leaders have got the spine to add value. So this will work. Let's just give them the raw material and let us get our cars and our air conditioners and deep freezers and stuff free. So it will, it will work well for us. You see, in the, if you are looking at development strategy, it's not just about allowing everything into your country that, so that the prices come down. That makes it better for your economy. What we are going to experience is that it is going to be duty-free, quota-free. You cannot place quota on the quantity of the goods that are coming into but, your well, country. We don't make them, so we don't need any quota. I mean, we don't make a fridge. For instance. So if they're going to bring 25 million fridge for every citizen, fair do, because we don't make a fridge. We don't intend to make a fridge. Why do you say we don't intend to make fridge? Because fridges? we don't have the energy to even make a, set up a fridge factory. And we, as, as we sit here, we haven't seen any, you know, energy coming up anywhere. We, we have doomed so, we are struggling with doomed so. It is because we have resigned ourselves to that fate, that we can never do it. If that is what we want to tell ourselves, that look, let us forget about development for this country and then continue to depend on the EU and other countries for all that we need, then so be it. But you see that our policies, internal policies, the present state of the nation address talks about domestic production, which is contrary to allowing everything into this country. You can't talk about domestic production, boosting domestic production, when you allow everything to be dumped into this country. Even Ghana, we have recently banned used fridges into this country. Mm -hmm and allowed only new fridges into the country. Why is it that we don't just allow the used fridges? Because we think that when they come, eventually it is more costly than the initial price that we pay for them. The point here is that when we allow everything to come into this country, it does not mean that everything is going to be used for production. Our roads are choked. There's congestion everywhere. Is someone doing calculations, the economic loss that we, 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 this country in care with the traffic jam, is someone doing calculations about how much fuel we now have to import and therefore creating foreign exchange pressures on the economy just because we have so many vehicles into this country? All these things is not free. Once then is someone doing calculations to tell us how much spare, spare pass, how much do we spend on spare pass? into this country because we have allowed everything to come into this country. So it is when they give you a car, they have indirectly asked you to buy more fuel and then also to buy spare parts from them, even if they don't say it. Because at the end of the day, you need to repair that. But you see, they, they, they've given us a car. 
Nothing stops us from decentralizing from Accra and Kumasi, you know, so that we go to the rural areas, set up, you know, things there so that all the cars are not congested within Accra, which chokes us. So it's, it's, it's as if, you know, we have refused to move forward on our own. And now we are blaming them. I, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's majorly our fault. Yes, whether it is our fault or not, if in the past it is our fault, then we have to wake up from that slumber, that sleep, and say that, look, yes, we did things the wrong way. Today, we are going to begin to do things the right way. So what stops us from going to the Chinese? Very good. That is the question. Why are we not going there? And why is the EU trying to lock us in, in this type of trade arrangement? Why is the EU doing that? It's because the EU is looking into the future and know that Look, they are being beaten to their doorstep by the emerging economy. Now, they have to come to Africa, they have to come to West Africa, they have to come to Ghana and make sure that they lock us in, that they will continue to have our cocoa for their factories. They will continue to have our raw materials for their industries. And then they will in turn sell their manufactured goods to us duty-free and quota-free. You know, why... Is good quota free in the sense that you cannot stop the quantity that is coming into your country. No, you can't stop the quantity. No quota. And then the duty free, you cannot place a single tariff on it. You see, but things like, uh, I said, both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have excluded chicken and other meat, tomatoes, onion, sugar, tobacco, uh, beer, worn clothes. Cote d'Ivoire has also excluded cement, malt, gasoline, and cars, while Ghana has excluded wheat, frozen fish, and industrial plastic. So these things, uh, they, you know, the country seem to want to put a quota on agriculture or stuff like that. But I think things like cars and air conditioning, but let me just acknowledge uh, John Gachi, uh, who's a lecturer at uh, Cape Coast University. Uh, John, you're welcome. Thank you. John, I, well, I'm discussing EPA and the ramifications, whether we sign or don't sign. I have uh, Edward here, who's a uh, obviously union guy who's obviously uh, is not happy with it and thinking no we shouldn't sign it and uh, I just want to find out from you I mean do we have any option other than sign it or should we sign it what what's your position well I have made my position known quite clearly uh, that looking at our position in the back end, it is going to be very difficult for us not to sign uh, the EPA mm -hmm. uh, because of various reasons. Uh, I just want to concentrate on the economic aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, you realize that Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana are producers of similar commodities for the international market. Uh, there are some advantages and recognition when you sign on to the EPA, uh, your market access to the European uh, market is more enhanced. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, it can affect our competitiveness. Uh, it can affect other commo agriculture commodities that we actually produce together. Uh, virtually, we export almost the same thing. So we must look at what is even happening in terms of competition uh, with our neighbors who have already signed on to the pack. We must also look at the uh, ability of these uh, uh, European countries to continue to uh, determine the way our economy is run because they support us a lot in various ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so given all these factors, uh, I have come to the conclusion that uh, though we are going to lose uh, in, 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 in signing, uh, the cost-benefit analysis should indicate that uh, if we sign, uh, it is so far better than not signing. John let, me, John, let me come in here before you continue. I mean, uh, if I look at the world today, you know, you have America, you have Australia, you have the Russias, you have the South Americas. I mean, there's nowhere else to do business other than Africa. Can we not... Start, put our foot on the ground and say, look, you have nowhere to go, and therefore, if you don't play by our rules, forget it. Because, 
I mean, where else can the EU go to do business or find raw materials other than Africa? Well, I think the answer is very easy for us. We have a lot of natural resources. Mm -hmm. But why is it that if you look at all our natural resource agreement, uh, it is quite clear that those who bring their capital uh, gain more in terms of uh, uh, the benefits accruing from the natural resources than the owners of the resource. Mm -hmm. uh, in bargaining and in actually positioning yourself, uh, you need to actually look at uh, a lot of things that will position you very well in the bargaining uh, uh, you know, uh, process. But as a continent, as a country, as a sub-region, we have not been able to do that. Uh, you know, in the past three years, after the global financial crisis, the entire world, if you read a lot of investment flow reports, indicate that Africa is the next frontier. Mm -hmm. uh, that should have given indication to our leaders how we should prepare ourselves to receive these investors, traders that are targeting our market. But we have not prepared ourselves. Therefore, when it comes to bargaining, you are very weak at the bargaining table. That is exactly what is happening to us. I mean, uh, <laughs> you see, uh, sometimes, I, you know, if I want to put it bluntly, it's like we deserve what we are getting. But, you see, you look at Mauritius, you look at Singapore, you look at all these other countries who basically don't even <coughs> have anything. But because they built uh, their human resource, uh, they were able to, you know, make their country wealthy. I mean, can't we have a 10, 15-year plan to say, look, let us just uh, make the country more intelligent so we make more money rather than Hello? depend? Uh, John, can you hear me? Yes. It is not correct to say that Singapore and co. don't have anything. In fact, if you have every natural resource but you don't have strategic focus, the one who does not have any single natural resource have strategy for the future has a lot of resources that's, that's, more than you have. Well, that's why I was getting to that. Why don't we develop the human capital rather than the, uh, you know, the, the, the natural resource? It depends on how you are developing the human capital. Because the, 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 you, the, reason, the take... reason why I say this is that EPA came on the table 14 years ago. 14 years. And I'm not sure by that time anybody who was in JSS 1 by now would have finished university. You know, so we could have positioned ourselves. I mean, 14 years is enough time to, uh, to plan anything. That is the point I am making. Uh, that if we don't prepare for the battle, you go to the battle, you will definitely lose. Uh, countries have strategy. They want to continue to remain important. They want to continue to make their citizens and their businesses relevant. And they have been thinking, they have people who think for the country, uh, or go through policies, learn what is going around the world and how they can inculcate that into their policies uh, strategies going forward. We have not been able to do that. And that is why we are where we are. I share the sentiment of many people who are against the EPA, but we do not have the strength to fight against the EPA. <laughs> that is the position we are right now. So if we shout, we, we are just shouting. We are just being emotional. This is the time that we should learn our final lesson, think strategically into the future. There are a lot of examples of things happening right now which you have serious ramification 20, 30 years to come. Are we going to continue to be the way we are when EPA come to hit us? That is what, as a nation, we should be thinking about. But if we put placard, etc., against EPA, we are not preparing ourselves for the future. And as a nation, we should tell ourselves this plain truth. Hold on, John. Now, Edward, you, you have a list of how much uh, we make in taxes and how much grants we get, and if we can afford to, to lose it. If, if you run this through that. I mean, if we don't go with the European Union, I mean, are these grants coming from the European Union or world, the worldwide? Yeah, we, we, what I have here is picked from our budget statements from 2010 to 2014. And then in 2010, we have uh, international trade taxes 
was uh, uh, was below the total grants that we we got mm -hmm. for that year, uh, which was uh, uh, 1,141 for trade taxes, and then the grants were 1,364. In 2011, our trade taxes rose to 1. 1,411, and then the grants came down to 1,346. In 2012, the trade taxes revenue, revenue from uh, international trade uh, taxes, rose, from one ta uh, rose to 1,973. Grants came down to 1,156, and then 2013, uh, total revenue from international trade taxes came up to 3,689 and then that of grants came to 1,258. Now for 2014, which is the estimate, if this comes to be true, we are expecting 4,051 from uh, international trade uh, uh, taxes revenue. And then grants is 1,130. Now, it tells us that over the period, revenue from trade taxes has been increasing. And that is going to be eroded if we sign the EPS. Because those goods on which that we have been placing the tariffs on are going to be removed because they will come duty-free, quota-free. <clears throat> now, you can see that the grants are declining. And grants are... Is based on the donors, mm -hmm. what they think. So we we'll have declining grants, and then we have a declining uh, 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 trade taxes. So the future for this country will be that once we sign into the EPAs, then we have low revenue from international uh, trade taxes, then we have low grants, and then total revenue will be small, will be very small, and then it will constrain government's ability to finance projects, then we then have to go in for more loans. And there will be social agitation. They will not be able to pay uh, 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 raise salaries, meet social infrastructure, and the whole country will be in crisis. We have, we have 14 years to plan. Yes, and that is what uh, Mr. Gachi said. We did not prepare for the battle. We are not also saying that, look, don't sign the EPS at all. We are saying that let's sign the EPAs, but then don't let us sign it in the form that it is. We have all along been concentrating on the quantitative aspect of the EPAs. That is not the only part of it. It has the qual qualitative implications. Let me take a quick break here before my director kills me, but stay tuned because it's getting more exciting. So we're coming straight back. Well, hello and welcome back. And... Uh Edwards was doing a comparison about the quantitative and the qualitative, but before I'll let you finish. Uh, let me see if I still have John. John. John, have I still got you? Yeah. Very good. John, now, under the proverbial leaders that we have had in the past, in you know, Ghana and Africa, then EPA is the best thing since sliced bread. But if by any chance we are to get a Kwame Nkrumah come back, then we, you know, we we'll then hit the brick wall thinking, oops, we shouldn't have signed this because here we are with the leader who wants to set up factories and actually add value. But other than that, EPA is the best thing. Well, I think I would rather want to focus on uh, what the EPA provides and uh, what our fears are. Uh, I think that at this point in time, we as a people are not asking the right question. Uh, for example, uh, the EPA also provides a conduit through which uh, we can maximize our export into the European market. Uh, we are not asking questions uh, as to how uh, we can get access to the broader European market. Uh, people are still thinking about Europe as uh, Netherlands, uh, Germany, UK, etc. There are many, many economies within the European bloc that we which either do we were not able to get certification for some of our products into their market. 
this is an ample opportunity where we are all complaining about the revenue losses and the implication that it has for our fiscal position. I think that it is important that if we are serious, we should be thinking about how we are going to maximize the conduit open to us for our export into the broader European market. Round it up for me, John, so that I can bring Edward in before I finish. Uh, I think if I can finish my point sure. on this. Uh, then there are other issues that uh, Mr. Edward raised about the fiscal situation. Uh, when you are doing that comparison, it is also important to look at our economy. The level of the, uh, of the fiscal benefit from the import and all those things is also largely dependent on the macroeconomic indicators of your country. Uh, if you look at exchange rates, for example, depreciation alone increase the import duties for the country. So you must also be looking at the kind of economy you are running as against the, the so-called tax revenue that you are getting from import. Do we like the level of our, uh, our, our, our macroeconomic indicators and what they project as if we are getting a lot of import duties? We also need to look at that. Then again, we should not only look at the benefits that we get from European countries, only in terms of budgetary support. <laughs> there are many, many, many technical support that we get from European countries in electoral process, in defense, security, governance, many other areas we do not even pass through the budget. John, let me, I need, yeah. to bring, I need to bring uh, Edward in here before my time runs out, please. Okay. Good. Edward, if you want to respond to that, I mean, 27 other countries, I mean, I, I wonder what we're going to give them, generators, cars, air conditioners, what are we going to give them other than more raw material? Well, just as uh, the time we signed the Cotonou Agreement, the EU countries were 15. Mm -hmm. Now they are 27. It also means that all the 27 will also have access to our market. Mm -hmm. By the analysis that Gaji is giving, mm -hmm. it means that we also have access to that market. But it's not just about the market there. It's just about our ability to access that market, if it is open. What is our production base? Now, if you look at it, the qualitative part that I'm talking about, the EPS is also saying that, look, once you sign into it, public uh, government procurement comes under the EPA. Then investment, services, uh, intellectual property, all come under the EPA. We are saying that these things are not part of the WTO compliance. Okay. And they don't need to be under the EPA. Let's move, remove all these things out of the EPA and then deal with the EPA as it stands, which is necessary for WTO relationship so that we don't have problems with the uh, uh, WTO rules. Again, they have also extended capital accounts to be part of the EPA, which is not a requirement by WTO. So we are saying that let's remove all this away. Because public government procurement is a huge area that government can leverage in this sector with its uh, 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 budgetary resources. But with the EPAs, it then says that if, for instance, you want to spend your budget in a particular area, you must necessarily bring that one to international bidding. And international bidding here is the EU companies must also be part of that bidding process. You can no longer restrict it to the local uh, 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 producers or suppliers or whatever. It's open to all the 27 open countries. to the 27 countries, including your local. Uh, and we know very well that our people will be outnumbered in this particular area. And that is not good for us. Let's remove those things and put them aside. If they were a requirement under the WTO, fine, but it's not a requirement under the WTO. Why is the EU interested in that? So we are therefore saying that let's go on with a trade pact with the EU, but then we should not sign it in the form that it is. And therefore, let's remove these items which are not necessary for the EPA, and then we can go ahead and sign it. Edward, thank you very much once again, folks. I'm sure you formed your own uh, judgments while you were watching us to whether we should sign or we shouldn't sign. But 
coming to look at things, I think you and I, civil society, you know, have also, you know, got a big part to play in it. We should have agitated a bit more to uh, make sure that value has been added to whatever it is that has been sending out. So it's here today. Let's see how best we can make it so posterity doesn't suffer. Thank you for watching, and tomorrow we'll be back to do it all over again.